institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3. Now, coming up this afternoon, three grand to fly to Rwanda. Well, that's what the government is offering to failed asylum seekers under new plans to curb migration. Meanwhile, should assisted dying be legalised? Keir Starmer confirms he would open it up to a vote as a poll finds. 70% of Brits support it. And a ban on puberty blockers. NHS England stops children from taking these powerful drugs on the prescription. All of that's coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Natal Natalia Hawkera. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak has defended the toy backer who's alleged to have made racist comments about Diane Abbott. Frank Hester is reported to have said the veteran Labour MP made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. At Prime Minister's questions this hour, Rishi Sunak says he will not hand back the £10 million given to his party by Mr Hester. Mr Speaker, the alleged comments were wrong, they were racist and he has now as I said, the comments were wrong, they were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse and that remorse should be accepted, Mr Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. The Prime Minister has also faced criticism over his new alternative Rwanda scheme. Under the new plan, migrants refused asylum could be offered up to £3,000 each to move to the African nation. However, there was some good news for the Prime Minister around his pledge to get the economy growing. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show it expanded in the first month of the year by 0.2%, signalling the UK is on a good path to exit recession. Vladimir Putin says he's planning to send troops to Russia's border with Finland once the country's officially part of NATO. In a three-hour television interview, the president said systems of destruction will also be set up along the Finnish border. He also said Russia is ready for nuclear war, but said the Kremlin doesn't wish to use such weapons. The United Nations says food has been delivered to northern Gaza for the first time in three weeks. Six lorries from the World Food Programme have crossed the gate in the Gaza border fence. It comes amid warnings more than half a million people living in Gaza are one step away from famine. The EU's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, says the EU is working to get more aid into the region. We are facing now a population fighting for their own survival. Humanitarian assistance needs to get into the Gaza and the European Union is uh, working as much as we can in order to make it possible. The head of the London Fire Brigade says the service has now completed all the recommendations made by the first stage of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. The brigade has invested a new kit including drones, radios and a turntable ladder which can reach up to 23 storeys high. Andy Rowe says he owed it to the survivors of the Grenfell Tower tragedy to reform the service. It's also about recognising the loss and the pain of the bereaved and the survivors and making a promise to them that this change, the change you, you, you're listening to today, is owed to them, uh, and we owe it to them to keep on listening, to keep on learning, to keep on making that change. And around a million adults in the UK are still smoking menthol-flavoured cigarettes despite a nationwide ban. A study by researchers at University College London has revealed that 16% of smokers, that's one in seven, are still accessing them despite them being made illegal in 2020. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's looking like a rather rainy day for some parts of the UK. If we take a look at the earlier satellite and radar picture, you can see the rain started off across many northern and western parts of the UK. It's now mostly cleared for much of Scotland and Northern Ireland, but it's going to linger for most of this afternoon across parts of northern England and the north and west of uh, Wales as well. Meanwhile, the rest of England and Wales seen some good breaks in the clouds, so bright or sunny spells, and with a mild airflow, temperatures are above average for the time of year, so feeling pleasantly mild in the sunshine. But a cooler day for Scotland and and Northern Ireland, although mainly dry and sunny, except for blustery showers in the northwest. Now, overnight, that cold front starts to edge its way further northwards as the low pressure system to the north of the UK moves away. So it heads up towards parts of southern Scotland, much of Northern Ireland, still lingering across much of Northern England, and another batch of wet weather heads to the west of Wales. Elsewhere, a mostly dry night, mild in the south, cool and chilly across uh, the clear spots in Scotland. Through tomorrow, that rain continues its journey further northwards to the central belt of Scotland as well as across southern Scotland and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, there will be sunny spells and showers most frequent across western parts of England and Wales. Mild once again, though. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next two hours, including calls to legalise assisted dying, and we'll be discussing that ban on puberty blockers. And today we're joined in the studio by T Talk TV's international editor, Isabel Oakshot. Great to have you on board, as always, Isabel. Uh, let's talk about uh, PMQ's Prime, Prime Minister's question times when uh, the two leaders went at it, hammer and tongs about that fascinating Westminster bubble topic, whether or not <laughs> someone we've never heard of said something racist fi ago. five yeah. years ago. Uh, what I thought uh, was, I thought Rishi did quite well defending himself. I would have said to the uh, Labour leader, Keir Starmer, uh, oh, yes, sir, we're very sorry about the member for Hackney, uh, Diana, but to just remind us, will you, Keir, uh, why she is currently suspended from the Labour, Parliamentary Labour Party. I believe it's racism. Uh, yeah. Um uh, look, these rows, are, they're kind of frustrating in yeah, a way they because they don't, they're so unproductive. You know, yes. round and round and round we go, all getting into a great state of uh, high dudgeon about comments that were or weren't made years and years ago. It all just feels so pointless in a way. Um, that said, knowing how the cycle of these stories work, knowing how the politics of work, yeah, yeah. I would predict that it's quite likely, uh, very likely, I would say, that the Tory party will end up having to either give this money back or give it to some kind of women's yeah, charity or yeah, racism yeah. charity or something. Because while they've still, while they hold on to this money, uh, Labour will again and again and again mm. and again say, racist money, you're funded by racist money. And it's that's why so, they will just keep on with that. It's so ridiculous. To me, it's such an illogical precedent. And if it, if it does happen, I hope it does set a precedent that then people find donors to the Labour Party who should also who be a, yeah, getting their money back. Once upon a time back. said something. I mean, the but comments are awful. Are Let, let's not resile from that. No, no, but it no, doesn't, absolutely it doesn't even logically make sense. Someone said something awful like four or five years ago. They've given money to a political party subsequently, so now they've got to get it back. Well, if that's the case, it's like, well, if I said something awful four or five years ago and I subsequently paid my TV licence, should the BBC be sending that back? Because that yeah. doesn't, you know, yeah. represent the BBC's values. It just does, even logically, it's like they confect these big issues and not only do they decide what they think is right or wrong in terms of mm. what is absolute racist mm. language, mm. what should be chastised, what should be apologised for, they then come up with some sort of punishment to fit their confected crime. And the punishment they've now come up with in the court of woke is, oh, well, money must yeah. therefore not be accepted, even though this happened years ago. It's just, it's just a nonsense. Here's the deal with this. You know, we, of course, we abhor racism. This guy did make racist comments and uh, should be condemned for that. Uh, and we should try to cut racism out of public life. In fact, we should try to cut racism out of life altogether. It's a horrible thing. Uh, but you're telling me that people who live in the Midlands and the North and around the shires yeah. and the provinces are lying awake at night and going, oh, my God, I think that somebody I never heard of has said some racist things, and, oh, my God, I think he gave some money to the Tory party. This is classic mm. Westminster is. bubble nonsense. It is, and so much of it is, you know, so much of the, the narrative, that what dominates the agenda 
is that kind of nonsense. And look, ladies and gentlemen, that is why Lee Anderson is in the position he is now, yeah. you know, because he actually gets it in terms of what people are really saying and thinking and feeling in places that are a long way away from yeah. the mm. M25. Yeah. I would say one other thing about this, which is the scrutiny of anyone who gives money to any political party is absolutely brutal. And, yeah. you know, unless mm. people give money to political parties, then they can't actually build a base. So right. I, I, I do worry at the, at the extent to yeah. which anyone who gives money to a political party, their motives are impugned. Every single thing they've said or done mm. in the past is raked oh. over, dissected. We're going down a dangerous path here. Look at what's recently happened in Belgium. A very nationalist politician who uh, is connected to Vlaams Belang, which is now the biggest political force in Belgium, has been sentenced to prison for a year because he was in a WhatsApp group that shared, yes, they were deeply offensive memes, but they were deeply offensive memes. I sort of think, mm. what is going on if people yeah. are now being jailed yeah. for sick jokes? It's, thought, just, it's thought really crime, bizarre. Thought crimes. Thought crimes, yeah. yeah, hate crimes, the same as thought crimes. Uh, we'll be coming back to this later in the show. But there are another big story that's breaking today, and for once I'm going to support Keir Starmer on this. Uh, he has called for an open vote on assisted dying, so this won't be party allegiance. I've always been rather confused as to why the body politic in Westminster have decided uh, that we can't make decisions about our own bodies. Uh, but assisted dying is back on the agenda uh, and so we are asking should Brits be allowed to make their own decisions about ending their own lives uh, give us a call let us know what you think on 0344 499 1000 or you can text us write talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222 or you can tweet us on x at talk tv now to our top story, and thousands of migrants unlawfully living in the UK will be offered up to £3,000 to voluntarily move to Rwanda. That's under new legislation proposed by the government, which aims to bypass the legal challenges faced by that original deportation scheme by making relocation a choice. Under the New Deal agreed with Rwanda earlier this year, migrants will receive housing and support when they arrive in the African country, but only if they go there voluntarily. Voluntarily. Asylum seekers who refuse the financial incentive will be unable to officially work or claim benefits in the UK. Well, joining us now is immigration lawyer Ivan Sampson. Ivan, have you ever heard of such a peculiar thing as this? A government paying someone who's entered their country, one assumes illegally, if they're not actually being granted uh, asylum here, uh, money to then go and live in another country? Hi, Ivan. Can you uh, can you hear us? I can hear you perfectly well. Thank okay. you. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Hello. Hi, Ivan. Yeah. So I was just saying, what? A, a, this is rather unprecedented, isn't it? They can't get a, a, a single plane off the ground due to all the legal objections to uh, the once much uh, fated Rwanda scheme, and so now they're going to actually give money to people who have come from wherever in the world to go and relocate to another country. This is this is quite bizarre. Well, such schemes have been running for many years, actually. And uh, most years you get around about 15 or 20,000 people taking up these schemes. The difference with the Rwanda scheme is that we've got people who have been rejected, have their asylum cases rejected, but we can't send them back to their own country because there's problems with identity documents or indeed their country might not be willing to accept them. So they're essentially stuck here. Um, and. It, it's a bit different from the other Rwanda scheme that the government tried to implement, which the courts have said that you can't send them to Rwanda because it's not safe there. Now, there's a moral argument to this. Is, is it right to send offer money to people to go to a country which the court said is not safe? The Joint Committee on Human Rights in, the, in, in Parliament says it's not safe. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch and the UNCHR have said it's not safe. So there is a, an argument, is it morally right to do that, offer money to people? But it won't work unless it's also a stick. You can offer carrots to send people money, send, send people, give people money to go leave the country. But many countries detain uh, asylum seekers who have had their asylum cases rejected. And I've always advocated for this, that if, you, if you've had your asylum case rejected and you haven't got identity documents of who you actually are, there is an argument to put them in, into some sort of detention. Um, the thing is, Ivan, 
you know, I kind of object to this as a British taxpayer. I don't want the government giving uh, illegal migrants uh, thousands of pounds to go to another country. Uh, why can't they just be taken to another country? They arrived here illegally. We've got a nice place where you can go. Uh, you're off to Rwanda and you're not getting any money from British taxpayers. How about that as a compromise? Well, the courts have said the government can do that. The Supreme Court. Yeah, says but I don't want to do that, and nor will nor will many, nor will millions of British taxpayers. The government is being uh, rather uh, kind of uh, 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 sort of slap happy with our money. I would suggest. It's Kevin. It, it's actually cheaper to do that than to continue for uh, for people to continue to live here, and we've got to provide support. And this is the other thing. In my experience, in twenty years, I've been. Uh, practicing immigration law here. Um, when you allow people to stay here over a long period of time, what happens is that they end up uh, in relationships, having children, and it makes it even harder to remove people because of their human rights, uh, having formed a family life here. So these schemes can work if, well, once someone's rejected, they're offered immediately to the, to people. Um, it can work, um, but but remember that. We don't know what Rwanda's getting out of this, and the government haven't told us that. What are we paying Rwanda to take these people? We might be paying the individual three thousand pounds, but what are they paying Rwanda? What's the true cost? Right. And what are the numbers? Uh, uh, we're Ivan, Ivan, about? we're with uh, Isabel Oakshot, uh, who's uh, busting to get a question. Well, into I am. You. I've got two points to make. Really, I mean, how about first point? Here's an idea: you don't actually let them come here in the first place. I think you make a really mm. good point about the longer you let people stay here, the more likely they are to establish ties, which then make it even harder for us to remove them. But I, look, this kind of complicated thing doesn't need to be that complicated. You just stop the boats from coming here in the first place. Uh, the second thing I wanted to pick up on is your very excellent point about what is Rwanda getting out of this? And I don't think enough questions are actually being asked about our curious relationship with Rwanda, which has many faults in it. We've been focused on its record for safety. Is it a nice enough place for people to be deported? But Rwanda is up to all sorts of pretty dubious and murky things in relation to its neighbour, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I think the Democratic Republic of Congo would have quite a lot to say about Rwanda's role in fueling terrorism over there. So this is not a country that we should necessarily be shoving a load of hard-earned British taxpayers' money at. And that £3,000, most people will have to work about 300 hours to raise that amount of money. You know, think of it in terms mm. of what taxpayers have to do mm. to create enough money to send one person home. And to me, I just think this scheme is absolutely bananas. By the way, I, Ivan, I, 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 well, have you know, you say that uh, there are a lot of uh, bodies that have said that Rwanda's not a safe place, but let me tell you, 650 British MPs took a vote on it, and even though most of them couldn't point to Rwanda on a map, they voted that it's safe. So what do you have to say about that? Well, you can call, uh, you know, black, white or white, black. And I if you're know. parliament and you're sovereign and the will of parliament and, and talk to Jacob Rees-Mogg about this. Parliament's supreme. It can do anything it wants. It can actually say Rwanda's safe and, hey, presto, it's safe. No, you, you've got to look at the evidence. And the evidence points to an overwhelming conclusion. It's not a safe country. It's run by a dictator who arbitrarily uh, detains people. There's extrajudicial killings by Paul Kagame. Um, and uh, you you stand in Rwanda, Kevin, with a flag, uh, with, with a banner which says, Paul Kagame out. Let's see what happens to you. Yeah. Well, so, is... no, it's, it's not a safe no, I'm being, I'm being well, I facetious. Say... I thought that vote was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in Parliament, <laughs> and uh, that's saying something. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't, I don't think uh, many people who might end up going to Rwanda who've been illegally, uh, you know, who illegally came here are going to join politics in that country, yeah. but there you are. Um, but what, what strikes me is whatever the government tries to do, whatever the government thinks would be a great deterrent, and you're talking about putting people whose asylum has been denied into detention, there's always is going to be some sort of legal contest. It is as predictable as night following day. And I think, how do we stop all this? When does this end? You know, the Bibi Stockholm wasn't good enough for a lot of people who were supposed to be going there. They had lawyers representing them saying they don't like being on the water. It's bad for their mental health. They're terrified and all the rest of it. So I'm sure that there won't be a single migrant if 
any such detention centre existed who would uh, happily go there and not have some sort of legal representation to avoid that. Um, what you're even seeing in terms of the accommodation that they're giving three-star, four-star hotels, that isn't always good enough for them either. And so I just wonder, how on earth is the government supposed to unpick what is one of the biggest challenges of our time? We're not the only country facing it without actually at some point breaking international law. Isabel's absolutely right what is, she said. You see, the, the UK border force is dysfunctional. Their own inspector said that. And there's loads of reports, and I'd love to read them, uh, that have been suppressed by the government. Um, no, our borders are not secure. We don't have secure borders. And until we do, we're going to get a flow of people coming across. We've got to work with our neighbours across the channel. We've got to work with the French and the EU and have a yeah. treaty which allows us to return people that illegal, irregularly enter the UK well, on I, small boats. I, my problem, and until we do, I was say, the they will I... keep, keep coming. Yeah, the problem I have with this is uh, the conditions that someone like the EU wants in return for signing such a treaty is that we have to agree automatically to take a certain quotient of all of the migrants entering the EU. So we're essentially giving up control of our own borders to an organisation that the people of Britain democratically voted to no longer be part of. They can't control their frontiers, that's for sure. But, it, you know, I found out the other day that Greece is actually turning boats around. It's not being widely reported, but Greece are now intercepting boats. And Belgium boats did as well. And other sending them back. Other countries do right. this, and they do it very effectively. And what the idea law says this, we can't do this? That's the what idea I want that to this know. should be completely impossible is absurd. We should simply do it and see what the consequences yep. are. And yeah. I bet you anything, the sky would not fall in. With this £3,000 thing, all we are doing yeah. is adding yet another pull factor. Yeah. And you know, the European uh, Court of Human Rights, uh, what we should do, uh, we are the country that uh, sort of worships the ECHR. Everything they say, we go, oh, yes, oh, we won't take the plea. Mm. Other countries in Europe, Germany, France, just right. completely ignore the ECHR. Yeah. We should try that. Well, well, we've got to comply with our international treaty obligations. And that's the laws right. uh, of UNCLOS and SOLAS. And this is international treaty we obligations... We don't have to, Ivan. We don't have to. I this is the sort of no, nonsense that's got us into this we mess. Either, we either sign these, up to... These ridiculous le you know, international agreements. Other countries, if they don't like them, it's... they just ignore them. Yeah. And that's what we should do. Yeah. Uh, anyway, That's Ivan, good, good to talk to you as always, country. mate. Uh, Ivan Sampson, the immigration lawyer. Isabel, you know, what strikes me here is I'm reading more and more in the press, something that I've known a long time myself, which there are huge forces at work controlling these mass migratory flows, not yeah. just very sophisticated mm -hmm. people trafficking rings, but we're talking hostile regimes who are using these yes. as an act of war. Yes. Now this invasion of people, whether it's across the border of America, into the EU, people rattling the fences at the border of Belarus and Poland, these people are being, being very willfully bussed places by horrible characters such as Putin. Now if that's the case, and we can very much point to intelligence and evidence that this is what's going on. Why can't we declare a national emergency and say to when it comes to international treaties, I'm sorry, but we need to take back control because this is a threat yeah, to our, our security. Because you completely can. I believe exactly. that we could completely do that. There are um, clauses which allow you to declare a national security crisis and do exactly what you've described. And look, it is a national security crisis. If you have got literally hundreds in, in boats coming over in any given week, sometimes it's literally thousands, mm -hmm. of people who we have no idea in many cases of what their origin is, what their intention is. The last thing we should be doing is casually saying, well, that's all right then, you know, come on in, you can stay as long as you want, and in the end, we might even bribe you there's with right. three there's, grand to leave. There's another aspect uh, that we're not really going to have uh, time to cover properly, but uh, this is uh, pretty alarming as well. Civil servants in the Home Office are, thre no. are threatening uh, to launch legal action against the government uh, because they say that if they're told to implement the Rwanda scheme, in effect, they'll be being ordered right. to break international and... law. And here's what I'd do if I was Sorry, the government. No. I'd say, uh, listen, you work for us and uh, we're the bosses and we tell you what to do and if you won't do it, mm. here's what we'll do. Sack you. Yeah, just yeah. quickly, Isabel, I want to know what actually happens if you break a treaty or international law? Do you, do, do you does know, your whole country go into prison? I was like, going to ask Ivan exactly that question yeah. because, as I said, the sky will not fall in. 
when you ask that question, what people will say, the lawyer, lawyerly types, is it, oh, it's not very good for our international status, you know. You know. Uh, our I, reputation I don't on the care. Inter- our reputation on the international <laughs> oh, stage. Yeah. Right. Here's what I don't care it, about. It's, our it's, reputation it's on the international stage. Anyway. No going, one cares. Like, who's going to sanction us? Russia's invaded Ukraine and seems to be trading with most of the world apart from yeah. Europe. Pretty yeah. fine. Right. I just don't anyway, understand. Anyway, should we get on with the rest of the programme? <laughs> <laughs> no, I like this one. Yeah, 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 we all do, but we've got to move on. Well, on that note, coming up after the break, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, revealed he wants to legalise assisted dying if he becomes Prime Minister. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t- when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. This is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer has personally committed to changing the law around assisted dying if he becomes Prime Minister. He made the comments in a phone call to the broadcaster Dame Esther Ranson. I'm personally in favour of changing the law. I can give you my commitment, Esther, absolutely, that if we are privileged enough to win the election, then we will make time for this vote. What I really do not want is for my family's last memory of me to be painful and suffering and me begging to be assisted in dying. Dame Esther has been campaigning for a change in the law since she was diagnosed with terminal cancer last year. It comes as a poll of more than 10,000 people this week found three quarters 
supported assisted dying. And we're very pleased to be joined now by Esther Ranson's daughter, Rebecca Wilcox. Uh, thanks for coming on board, uh, Rebecca. Well, this is encouraging, isn't it? I think the last time you were kind enough to come onto the show, we discussed at some length why it is that two-bit politicians think they have the right to tell us what we can do with our own bodies. Well, Keir Starmer is talking about a free vote, which was at least free the MPs from the shackles of party allegiance. 75% of the people in this country think we should have the right to decide what we do with our, our own bodies. Do you now feel that Parliament is about to uh, join the party and agree with the rest of the nation? It certainly feels like the dial has shifted. And um, thank you for having me on again to talk about it because it's so important to keep this momentum up. Whilst Sakir did say that he would have a free vote if he was elected pres um, president, <laughs> prime minister, where that's am I? That's what he wants. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's what he wants. Um, but he did say that would be about five years, which is obviously too late for mom and too late for thousands of people who are suffering today, tomorrow, yesterday. It's just, can we just do this now? There actually isn't that much going on in parliament. Everybody seems to be gearing up for the election. Why not have a vote now? Why doesn't Rishi Sunak go out on a high by giving something to everyone that we all want? Every single UK constituency was polled and they were all in favour of assisted dying. And not making a choice on it, Rishi Sunak, is still making a choice. So I'm really pleased, I'm really grateful, and I'm so delighted that that statement was made to Mum on the phone. But it won't help her and it won't help everybody else in the next five years. So come on, let's get going a bit faster. Absolutely. Given that this is uh, very unlikely to come online uh, in time for your mum to benefit from it, I don't quite know how to put that sensitively, really. Um, <laughs> Are her plans still the same? Would she still seek to go somewhere else? Yes. I mean, you'd have to ask her, and she's quite uh, private on the matter, which is unusual for her. But, um, <laughs> yes, her plans are still the same. She has paid up. She's a member of Dignitas. She would go there. The query would be who accompanies her. Um, I am deputy president of Childline and have signed a code of ethics. And I think being arrested in Luton Airport would be a bit of a problem with that. Um, but if Sakir could meet us off the plane, <laughs> maybe that would be good. Um, yeah, I mean, just to quickly uh, kind of summarise the objections, uh, religious groups, uh, religions mm -hmm. uh, often say, no, 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 it's a sin, it's a crime against nature to take mm -hmm. any life, even your own. And others talk about families cashing in on people who are dying, trying to sort of speed up the legacy process. But I would suggest that... You know, the number of instances of that actually happening will be negligible. You can't just nix a, a kind of idea like this because a few people might try and con people into dying. So uh, that would be my argument. Uh, but uh, so we are, Rebecca, because uh, we're going to talk to talk TV legend James Whale, who himself has been going through his own health battle uh, with cancer. Thanks for joining us, James. Uh, I mean, we're asking our viewers today... Uh, you know, should British people have the right to make their own decisions about ending their own lives? Uh, where do you stand? I absolutely agree with Rebecca and I agree with uh, Esther as well. Uh, nobody has a right to tell you what you can and cannot do. Um, as I'm sure most people know, I'm terminally ill, uh, have been for uh, about the last four or five years and uh, could go any time. Um, and I don't want to go through some of the pain that you begin to suffer. I mean, some of the some of the treatments give you more pain. But when I've decided I've had enough, I'm not going to let any other prat tell me because of their views uh, <laughs> what I may or may not do with my own life. Yeah. It, it seems to me that actually we're going to reach a position where this isn't inevitable anyway. There's uh, lots of discussions about uh, assisted dying being legalised in Scotland, Jersey, the Isle of Man, which would mean that we'd have a completely different picture, really, across the United Kingdom um, as to where it's legal and where it's not. But I think something a lot of people don't understand is in many respects, we actually have a form of assisted dying, if you will. If you're elderly and very poorly and you go into hospital, the Liverpool, Liverpool pathway is essentially designed 
things to sort of gently end your life and give you pain relief. So why is it, do you think, that there is such a problem with moving forward to actually creating a circumstance where that is in the open and legitimate? I can tell you exactly yeah. why. Because, sorry, who's that to? Well, I didn't actually <laughs> say to anyone, so... Oh, right. <laughs> you go first, Rebecca. Go on, Rebecca. Oh, sorry, James. Um, it's lovely to see you, by the way. All I was going to say about the livable pathway is that there are so many different types of cancer and illness that are terminal that are not affected by painkillers. So the pain will still break through the opioid barrier. And it isn't really the same as having an assisted death. I went to Parliament on Monday with Dignity in Dying. Um, and what uh, are the people that I spoke to who had lost loved ones in the most painful way, or they had taken their li own lives, hugely violent, they discovered um, bodies in all sorts of conditions. It, it, it's just insupportable. And what my mum said, which I really wanted to com to say, is that making this law and protecting vulnerable people against a few criminals who may take advantage of it is like saying we shouldn't choose to drive because there are a few bad drivers exactly. out there a bad case makes a bad law mm. and this is a bad law yes we should safeguard with teeth which is what keir starmer said and we will because it's 400 million people have mm. this already we can pick and choose the best parts mm. make it work for us protect people like James, like my mother, like all the people I met on Monday, who are so powerful and brilliant and inspiring, and we are not helping them, we are letting them down. I agreed. Uh, James, uh, this is what I think is so wrong about the current scenario. It is this, that Esther, should she decide uh, to end her own life, uh, you know, has got the money, uh, I'm sure you have to, to fly to Switzerland to go to Dignitas. She can afford it. Uh, ludicrously, technically, if Rebecca goes with her, when she comes back to Britain, uh, she could be charged with assisting a, mur uh, a murder or a death or something like that. So, you know, that is just insane, that relatives who go to say goodbye to their dear loved one come back to possibly face criminal charges, but everybody should be allowed to make this choice if they want to make it, uh, and that it should include people who can't afford 10,000 quid or whatever it is to go to Switzerland. Would you agree? Uh, I totally agree. I apologise about my dog, Daisy, who wants to come in and you might hear barking in the background. <laughs> you know, th this whole business is... Uh, it, it, we should be called no... Dip or should be an organisation, no dignity in dying. Because a lot of people will tell you, be quiet, Daisy. A lot of people will tell you that there is no there no pain at the end. There is, let me tell you, in many, many cases. Uh, and a lot of uh, doctors and nurses are very good. They will up your, uh, your painkillers and you will slowly fade away, and that's great. But what I'm concerned about is the amount of, of power that religion, whether it's Christian, Islamic or any other religion seems to be able to pull on other people. I am completely secular. I have private beliefs like we all do in my head and I don't wish to be told what I can or cannot do by a bunch of people who, who believe a story that probably isn't even true. Uh, very, very good point, uh, Rebecca, yes? I think it's an amazing point and it's one... I respect people who are of faith. I wish I had faith myself. It would be very comforting at a time like this. But I don't believe that anybody else's belief system should affect the amount of pain and dignity my mother has at her death, or I have at my death, or you have at yours. This is the thing that is inevitable. We are all going to die. And how we die reflects how we live in a country where we should be allowed to choose our own path. Yeah, thank you both for taking the time to Thanks, talk James. to us Thanks, on this uh, really thank sensitive subject. I mean, Isabel, I think everyone oh, thank here... thank you, Daisy, as well, by is the way. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, it seems everybody here is in consensus on this subject, that it almost now seems sort of medieval to have the approach that someone at the end of their life who is suffering, who may... When, when we talk about dignity, let's actually get into the details of this. People have lost control of bodily functions, so they're not necessarily, you know, clean, comfortable. People who might be in severe pain surely i mean we put our pets down if they're suffering yeah, a very good point that. if we can give that to an animal why on earth can we not give yeah. that to a human i mean i agree i've witnessed i'm afraid up close 
several deaths in the last few years and one of my mother in the last few months. And frankly, um, the way my mother died is not something that I would want to go through. It was pretty awful. <clears throat> the last week of her life was not dignified. Yeah. Uh, we did our absolute best for her as a family, but the setting in which she died in the NHS was not good. Um, there were so, I have many, many things to say around this, but it's not. it certainly made me think about my mortality and whether I want to end up in the way that she did. Now, she was very, very Christian and would not have wanted assisted dying and would have argued very vociferously against it. But I think it's a, it's the choice. It comes back to mm, the choice. Right. Fine, if you are of a person of deep faith and you think that only God has the right mm. to end your life, your last gasp, he, he almighty should have that moment in his power, fine. But you don't have to impose that choice on the rest of us. Yeah. And think about it. You know, people who've got some of these awful conditions like motor neuron oh, disease or something right. like that. Yeah. Now, you know, that's a downhill slide. So you've and got you two... two yeah, exactly oh, right. You, you, for the last oh. years of these poor people's lives, they are terrified of what the final months will uh, yes, bring. Uh, and right. this yeah. will excuse them of that terrible, yeah, undignified relieve them of that. Yeah. I also had to put down a, a much loved pet in the last few weeks. And I can't tell you how gentle that was. Yeah, it was, no, a, I've done it it was quick times. and it was beautiful and it was very, very tough, mm. but gone. Yeah. So peaceful. And, you feel, and you feel, I've done it uh, several times. No with trauma various, for the but animal. It, but you feel, you feel you're doing the right thing for the dog. And if it was a human being, of course, they'd make their but, own decision. But surely it enables the family as well to start putting into place plans, not just in terms yeah, 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 of totally, the, de the death yeah. but and the style of death, but the date of death, the funeral. All those arrangements can be calculated, worked out, so it can be a real sort of celebration, if you will. I mean, funerals aren't happy occasions, but they, they, they be. shouldn't be... <laughs> <laughs> I'll come to it, don't you worry. Yeah, cheer, but <laughs> pop, pop in the champagne. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting subject. Why do you think the Conservative Party have been so reticent mm. about talking um, about I this? I think there are a lot of Tory voters voters who are church goers or at least used to be uh, until the church effectively packed up during the pandemic and stopped <coughs> bothering welcoming people inside and so I think that, I think there's a faith <laughs> thing there um, obviously Catholics are staunchly broadly speaking staunchly against anything like this and I think that you know, most pol politicians do shy away from the most emotive subjects, like the mm. abortion subject. Politicians don't want to go there with that either. So I think it's a sort of political cowardice, actually. I do think it's coming. I think well, there's, there's a yeah. sort it of... It is coming, look, the whole thing... Get on of, with it. ...of people having to go to Switzerland and only then if they can afford right. it. It's grotesque, well, isn't if you, it? If you, you know, can go having to... Having to pack a one-way bag and take a plane. Well, the I think that repatriating we... the body, that's, that's the massive awful. headache, no, I the lot of it. I think it's really difficult to bring the body back. It's very difficult. No, exactly. It's extremely difficult. And the last time we uh, did this subject, Rebecca Wilcox came on and we just devoted the whole show to it. Yeah. And we had call after call, call after, after call. That people feel your, very, very that strong. broke your heart, yeah. these poor people, yeah. you know, it was really bad. Well, on that subject, this is, of course, our big question today, and we do want to talk to you. Uh, so if you've got something to say, get in touch. Your texts and tweets have been coming in. Uh, we asked, should Brits be allowed to make their own decisions about ending their own lives? Amy got in touch and thinks, yes, I have multiple health conditions, and my last responsibility to others is to remove myself. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy says, in some cases, yes, but the law must be written very carefully with strict caveats. But forcing someone with a terminal illness to end their lives in physical agony because of someone else's sensibilities is the height of cruelty. Ben tells us only if they do it themselves, but definitely not if they ask someone else to help them. Strange. Susie has messaged, I answered yes, simply because no one else and no government should have that power over anyone. Agreed. Penny says, yes, my body, my choice. I don't want anyone religious telling me I can't because of their views or any MP who just decides they don't like the idea. Hear, hear. Well, yeah, keep your thoughts coming in on this topic. We'll be continuing to read out your messages and hopefully talk to some of you as well a bit later on in the programme. Now, coming up after the break, Rishi, under pressure, the Prime Minister has been criticised for not refunding a donor accused of racism. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart screen. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. 
Now, you ain't going to have an evit, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Sir Keir Starmer has called out the Prime Minister over his mishandling of the party donor racism row. The Conservatives are under pressure to return the £10 million donated by Frank Hester after he made racist comments about the MP Diane Abbott. Well, speaking during Prime Minister's questions, Rishi Sunak insisted the matter was closed. The alleged comments were wrong, they were racist, and he has now, as I said, the comments were wrong, they were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse, and that remorse should be accepted, Mr Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. Mr Speaker, the man bankroll and the Prime Minister also said that the member for Hackney North should be shot. How low would he have to sink? What racist, woman-hating threat of violence would he have to make before the Prime Minister plucked up the courage to hand back the £10 million that he's taken from him? Uh. We're still, of course, joined by Talk TV's international editor, Isabel Oakeshott. I mean, actually, if you listen to how that uh, argument's progressed, it seems to me that this would just become a zero-sum game because Rishi Sunak used the opportunity to yeah. point out some of the things that people on Labour benches have said and even pointed out that Zakir Starmer himself, uh, back in his legaling days, made the decision to defend terrorist organisation or now prescribes terrorist organisation his boots to here. I mean, it's a madness, isn't it? If people 
people simply make a comment and then all of a sudden it becomes further down the line there's got to be some sort of retribution some sort of you know payment some sort of punishment this is just going to go back and forth both sides it and, and, will, and it would be an absolute feeding frenzy for yeah. Sunday newspaper journalists who can spend ages raking over every single thing anyone who's ever given money ever said I mean <laughs> certainly the Tories will not want to state the obvious they will not want to give back this money whilst they have a lot of very substantial donors something that always frankly surprises me given how little that they've uh, yeah, given how unimpressive their record is they still have multi-million pound donations coming in uh, but that sum of money is generally about half to a third of an election fund fighting campaign so you wouldn't really want to casually give that back under any circumstances. I'll be honest with you, uh, the only thing I really found particularly interesting about PMQs was uh, Lee Anderson, the new Reform UK MP, former Tory of course, across the house, uh, sitting next to George Galloway. I was... Um, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, yeah, there they are. slightly surprised <laughs> and um, somewhat dismayed, I have to say, to see that pairing. Yes. Um, and I hope there wasn't too much friendly chat between them because I don't think their views align on very much. <laughs> no, you couldn't actually find people with more diff uh, differing views, I'd say, on certain subjects. It's a naughty corner, I guess. Yeah, I suppose it <laughs> yeah. is. Uh, should we talk about uh, Sadiq Khan, the London mayor? Oh, do we have to? Uh, I'm, yeah. afraid we, I'm afraid we do, uh, because this is more evidence that uh, the people in charge of our various organisations and authorities, public uh, spending, just... Uh, absolutely squander money on diversity and inclusivity. He's blowing £366,000 on six diversity officers. Uh, and uh, they're going to all earn £61,000 a year, plus uh, very good pension pots. And their job, Isabel, uh, is to uh, make sure people are treated equally in an organisation by promoting positive practices and attitudes. <laughs> what? What is that? How is that I don't a job? Think any of the jobs. How are is necessary. that a job? None of them. I no. would ditch all these diversity yeah. and inclusion jobs right across all these sectors. I mean, the church as well. By the way, I've got to be in my bonnet NHS. about them <laughs> arguing, you know, advertising for ludicrous racial this and racial no, that. Billion you don't need pox. any of that stuff. Mm. Let's concentrate on what your core offer is. And Sadiq Khan, my message to you is your core offer is making London the most brilliant city no. it can be. Safe and secure with functioning transport. It's not about <laughs> diversity and inclusion officers. Yeah, I mean, what's mad about this, I think, is that Sadiq Khan's own office was the one who, when there was some sort of public awareness campaign or advert or brochure, I can't remember what it was, about something sort of life in London, it had a picture of a white family, and it came back Alatay to say, this doesn't represent London. I mean, how racist is that? It's yeah. absolutely ridiculous. But now, Good uh, political news. Oh, I, I was just going to say that uh, this diversity madness, that uh, the bulging diversity department department uh, in the Ministry of Defence, of all places, apparently there are 60 diversity officers in there. Uh, guess, a guess, department which pr guess really what they needs call the money. Guess what they call themselves? What do they uh, protecting the protectors. <laughs> it's oh pathetic, isn't I mean, it? I this is our money. Right. You're just blowing it. Well, what I don't understand, when you've got labour laws, when you've got, you know, human rights laws, you don't need these people. You've got a legal system that covers all of this. It should be based into our culture anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, everybody who's involved in recruitment should already understand yeah. that you've got to be diverse in your recruitment policies. Otherwise, what the hell are you doing being in charge of recruitment? Right. Yeah. Let's no, talk about the post exactly. office. Or you take it away, Alex. Yeah, so government has brought forward these new laws to clear the sub-postmasters uh, of any criminal convictions, uh, hoping to get this through very quickly uh, by July, which is sort of record speed, really, when it's not COVID. Um, so, no, this is good news, frankly. It was sort of uh, a long process, finally seeing a chink of light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, well, if the a deadline is July, then there's an obvious cut-off point, which is a summer recess. And if they don't get it done by then, there would be a real fear that it just disappears into the long grass of the next next government has to deal with it. There's actually kind of quite a, a small number of sitting weeks between now and whenever the next election is because you've got that huge long summer mm. holiday. So they do need to crack on with this and hopefully turn it around. Yeah, and they are, of course, dragging their heels. Uh, and they need another TV drama to get the government going, maybe. <laughs> Doing that for the blood uh, doning scandal now. They're going to make a TV drama about it Good. to get that one yeah. sorted out. You need a TV drama to get anything done in this country. So uh, perhaps there'll be one in future about the scandal of uh, prescribing... 
uh, kids uh, who uh, believe they're in the wrong body, gender dysphoria, dysphoria uh, puberty block blockers. The NHS has now decided they will no longer prescribe these life-changing drugs to kids, uh, which so begs wrong, the question, mate. why have they been what, prescribed what them the until... What the hell took them so long? Yeah. In fact, there is, a, there is a really good documentary on this. It's called No Turning Back, mm. and it describes the agony of young people who have taken these drastic irreversible decisions with their bodies and it isn't just a case that you have surgery and that's irreversible these puberty blockers do things to your body that are not reversible just by taking some other ones to go back again it just doesn't work like that yeah. these decisions should not they just should never ever have been carried out on mm. children. I, I cannot oh, fathom no, the, 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 the it's ignorance. It's jaw dropping. The it's jaw dropping. The stupidity. Some kind of sinister, dark, awful, malign experiment. Doctor, yeah. doctors yeah. sitting there with eight-year-old kids, Crazy. girls, yeah. because They're they climb trees. Oh, it's sick. It's ridiculous. I was but telling. Uh, about... a, I was telling um, uh, Alex earlier. I live quite near the Tavistock Clinic and the locals around that area call it Frankenstein's Castle, yeah, which well, is just about what it was. Yeah. Well, the big problem we have, I think, is that, you know, having Tavistock closed down wasn't enough for GIDS. Uh, they've actually decided to set up 300 similar clinics around the country. And nobody, yeah, right. nobody, nobody seems to be questioning why are so many children going, you know, balmy for the idea that they're not in, in born in the right gender I mean, body. I, I mean, it, it's it just... would actually be funny if it wasn't so deadly serious and tragic. I am sick of this whole thing. It's mm. disgusting. Children do not need this level of confusion. Some children like, some girls like to climb trees and wear trousers. Mm. Some boys might want to wear some pink things. It doesn't mean that they need to be in a different body, that they need to radically change their entire physique. Yeah. Kids be a, as young as eight went to the Tavistock Clinic. Yeah. Yes, it, it is, is grotesque. grotesque. I think it is criminal. It's going yes. to be looked back on as one of the hideous oh, mistakes. That. There will be massive payouts. Yeah, there's going to be a lot I'm of lawsuits. Sure there will as be well. a lot of lawsuits in the future. I mean, it's definitely. Well, the yeah. parents bear a lot of responsibility. Well, say. yeah, I mean, the whole system is ridiculous. So over 5,000 quid, uh, 5,000 quid, 5,000 kids went to that clinic in 2022 but uh up for so about 200 uh, that's about it before. for a very entertaining hour as always thanks Fantastic isabel to always great to have you isabel. here isabel oakshot there uh and uh coming up after the break the government has changed tack on its controversial rounder plan offering cash to those who voluntarily leave i'm kevin o'sullivan and i'm alex phillips and you're with talk tv on tv on radio online and on your smart speaker Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to Cross Talk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And we are with you live from 1 until 3 p.m. every weekday. Coming up in this hour, three grand to fly to Rwanda. That's what the government is offering to failed asylum seekers under new plans to curb migration. And an under-pressure Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, faces more criticism for his handling of the Tory race row. Meanwhile, a ban on puberty blockers. Why the NHS has U-turned on prescribing powerful drugs to children. All that coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with Natalia Huacera. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak has defended the Tory backer who's alleged to have made racist comments about Diane Abbott. Frank Hester is reported to have said the veteran Labour MP made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. At Prime Minister's questions just last hour, Rishi Sunak says he will not hand back the £10 million given to his party by Mr Hester. Mr Speaker, the alleged comments were wrong, they were racist and he has now as I said, the comments were wrong, they were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse and that remorse should be accepted, Mr Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. The Prime Minister is also facing criticism over his new alternative Rwanda scheme. Under the new plan, migrants refused asylum could be offered up to £3,000 each to move to the African nation. However, there was some good news for the Prime Minister around his pledge to get the economy growing. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show it expanded in the first month of the year by 0.2%, signalling the UK is on a good path to exit the recession. Vladimir Putin says he is planning to send troops to the Russia's border with Finland once the country's official part of NATO. In a three-hour television interview, the president said systems of destruction will also be set up along the Finnish border. He also said Russia is ready for nuclear war, but said the Kremlin doesn't wish to use such weapons. The United Nations says food has been delivered to northern Gaza for the first time in three weeks. Six lorries from the World Food Programme have crossed a gate in the Gaza border fence. It comes amid warnings more than half a million people living in Gaza are one step away from famine. The EU's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, says the EU is working to get aid to Gaza. We are facing now a population fighting for their own survival. Humanitarian assistance needs to get into the Gaza and the European Union is uh, working as much as we can in order to make it possible. The head of the London Fire Brigade says the service has now completed all the recommended recommendations made by the first stage of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. The brigade has invested in new kit including drones, radios and a turntable ladder which can reach up to 23 storeys high. Andy Rowe says he owes it to the survivors of the Grenfell Tower tragedy to reform the service. It's also about recognising the loss and the pain of the bereaved and the survivors uh, making a promise to them that th this change, the change you, you, you're listening to today, is owed to them uh, and we owe it to them to keep on listening, to keep on learning, to keep on making that change. 
And around a million adults in the UK are still smoking menthol-flavoured cigarettes despite a nationwide ban. A study by researchers at University College London has revealed that 16% of smokers, that's one in seven, are still accessing them despite them being made illegal in 2020. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's looking like a rather rainy day for some parts of the UK. If we take a look at the earlier satellite and radar picture, you can see the rain started off across many northern and western parts of the UK. It's now mostly cleared for much of Scotland and Northern Ireland, but it's going to linger for most of this afternoon across parts of northern England and the north and west of uh, Wales as well. Meanwhile, the rest of England and Wales seen some good breaks in the clouds, so bright or sunny spells, and with a mild airflow, temperatures are above average for the time of year, so feeling pleasantly mild in the sunshine, but a cooler day for Scotland and Northern Ireland, although mainly dry and sunny, except for blustery showers in the northwest. Now, overnight, that cold front starts to edge its way further northwards as the low pressure system to the north of the UK moves away. So it heads up towards parts of southern Scotland, much of Northern Ireland, still lingering across much of Northern England, and another batch of wet weather heads to the west of Wales. Elsewhere, a mostly dry night, mild in the south, cool and chilly across uh, the clear spots in Scotland. Through tomorrow, that rain continues its journey further northwards to the central belt of Scotland as well as across southern Scotland and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, there will be sunny spells and showers most frequent across western parts of England and Wales. Mild once again, though. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, including a ban on puberty blockers and the Tory race row. Uh, but towards the end of the show, uh, Alex, we're going to talk about dogs because... Uh, oh, yay, my favourite topic. Paul, yeah, but Paul O'Grady, great dog lover, he's got five himself presented for the love of dogs, the brilliant Battersea Dogs Home series. Uh, he's left 775,000 of his £15 million pound fortune uh, to animal charities, including Battersea Dogs Home. Uh, but he's also set aside £125,000 uh, to look after his own dogs, Nancy, Arthur, Conchita, Eddie and Sausage. And uh, everyone who owns a dog, including me, will understand exactly what's that about. It, you know, it, God forbid that I should leave this mortal coil. But if for any reason my dog was on his own, I would worry uh, unbelievably. I, you know, I, I worry about that dog being looked after properly. And so I can see exactly where Paul O'Grady is coming from. Yeah, I mean, people do get very attached to their pets. I don't think I'd be leaving any money, if I had any, to my cat. Uh, in fact, if anything happens to well, me, someone's going to have to just take, take poor little Mog on. But it reminds me, actually, of the Karl Lagerfeld story. Do you remember uh, that he left that a, basically a bit crazy, his entire that one, fashion though. empire yeah, yeah. to some sort of miserable cat, white yeah. moggy uh, that people sort of resented? But how do you... I mean, look, this is a lovely story. I agree with that. I, I think it's also important to point out, you know, all the amount that he's given to lots of different yeah, animal no, no, charities absolutely. around the world, uh, things protecting elephants and uh, things protecting yeah. orangutans, two of my yeah. favourite animals. Absolutely. Um, but he's leaving £125,000 to his dogs, five of them, so that's twenty. Five grand each. How much money can you actually spend on a dog? Uh, you don't own What's a dog, do you? No, you I don't, don't own a dog. Take them down the vet. That'll get rid of £125,000 in <laughs> about 10 minutes. Uh, they're not necessarily that cheap, dogs. Uh, so I can see where he's coming from. And if Nancy, Arthur, Conchita, Eddie and Sausage are sort of youngish, say they've got... I don't know, five years left, ten years left of their lives, uh, there'll be a lot of money involved in uh, looking after them. And I know where he's coming from. I just think it's a very, very sweet story that every dog owner will appreciate and will understand. And later in the show, we'll be talking to my friend, uh, actor and animal rights campaigner, Peter Regan, Downton Abbey star, ever decreasing circles, all that, uh, who himself... I know in the past has had five or six dogs, so he knows all about this. And he got involved, I'm, we'll ask him about this, but he got involved in his tireless animal welfare work because he got a dog and uh, realised a kind of connection, a connection between humanity 
and our animal friends. And uh, that is what I think this is all about. Uh, so uh, Paul O'Grady, a great dog lover, doing what all dog lovers would do for their dogs if they had a spare 125 grand. That's what it's all about, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd do the same with I my cats. I love my cat cats. Lady, cat I love person. my cat to pieces, but I'm not sure that what what she really wants to be honest. She doesn't really. She's she's very. Uh, she's not a labour intensive. Do you know what I mean? Put that in some well, biscuits. Leave the window open. Job done. Well, well, dog, don't really know what dogs the, kind of what are labour intensive. She wants. You know, she kind of likes sniffing around behind dustbins looking for mice. That doesn't really cost yeah. any money. So yeah. there you are. Different animals. Dogs are kind of uh, labour intensive, but uh, uh, also of course. Today we've been talking about assisted dying. Keir Starmer says he'll, uh, if he becomes prime minister or uh, in the next term of parliament, he'll try to uh, get a free vote on whether or not uh, we can have the right to take our own lives. 75% uh, of uh, Britain mm. uh, believes uh, that uh, we should ha make that, be able to make that choice at the moment. It's against the law. So, yeah. what have we been asking? We have been asking, uh, should Brits be allowed to make their own decision about ending their lives? Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. Last time we uh, did this on the show, lots of you called in some really emotional stories, which I think really helps to sort of put this debate in context. We would like to hear from you, so don't be shy about dialing up 0344 499 1000. Uh, you can text us, of course. The number is 8722. Do write talk before your message. Or if you're more inclined to being on Elon Musk's uh, Twitter, then you can, uh, or X as it's now called, yeah. you can tweet us at Talk TV. And indeed, your texts and tweets have been coming in uh, on one of the day's big stories, legalising assisted dying, as we were just saying. We asked if Brits should be allowed to uh, make their own decisions about taking their own lives. And Nina says... I'm surprised this hasn't been approved. Surely people ending their lives takes the burden off the government when it comes to mm. the NHS and carers. Very you know, it's a very, it's quite a cynical comment to make, but I was it's thinking that point. myself. It is point. a very good yeah, point. Well, no, yeah. Bob, yeah, Bobby says, uh, we wouldn't let an animal suffer, but we think it's okay for humans to continue suffering, even if life becomes unbearable. Absolutely good point. Zach writes, yes, but it has to be strongly regulated so we don't end up with the same situation as Canada, where people are simply depressed or disabled or allowed to use their made system. Yeah, I've read about Canada. They've, like most things that Canada yeah. does when it comes to sort yeah. of, you know, social uh, policy, uh, they, 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 they mess it up pretty badly. Yeah, old Justin Trudeau has made it uh, compulsory to take your own life. <laughs> well, with him in charge, maybe you'd like to. Uh, Jess has got in touch. She says, nothing was more painful than seeing my uncle wither away due to cancer. He wished he could have been euthanized, but he died a very slow <sighs> painful death. It is just so inhumane to keep someone in agonising pain. Well, we do have Vivian from Devon on the line. Vivian, tell us your story and your position on this. Um, I think it should be legal. When I was younger, I had a dread of dying. My husband can remember me telling him some extreme conditions I'd put up with just so I was alive. Then I got MS. Then the pain started and the loss of mobility. The last five years, the pain can be excruciating at times and it can still shock me. So I've gone from someone that dreaded dying to someone who, through experience, now thinks I should have the option at some stage of ending things peacefully. Yeah. And, and would, uh, you would like to be able to do that? So have you sort of made that decision about yourself? Should it become legal? Yes. I mean, I'm not there yet, but in the future, I mean, I don't know how much worse my pain's going to get. And you hear all these people who are against it saying, oh, get them the right pain relief as if mm. that's the answer. Yeah. It's not just pain that's the problem. And strangely, I have tried all the medication for nerve pain and I can't take them. So, you know, all these experts on pain, I'd like to know what they think I should take. It's, I think it's a very important uh, story you're telling us. My, my own uncle uh, suffered MS. He's not with us any longer, tragically. Um, and it was something he considered actually going to Switzerland because it isn't just about the incredible pain people with such debilitating conditions suffer, but also a complete destruction 
of quality of life. It's all very well someone sitting there able-bodied, able to go and see friends for brunch, go to a museum, get on a bus, uh, saying, oh, well, I don't think someone should be, you know, should be able to opt to end their life. But, you know, you try having your life essentially already taken away by a condition. I mean, do the, these people, I don't understand why they are so against it. If they care about people, then they wouldn't want to suffer, surely. Mm, couldn't agree more. The point is, Vivian, you're a grown-up, you're an adult. Um, uh, Alex and I are vaguely adults as well. I mean, we should be able to make grown-up adult decisions about our own lives uh, and not be treated like kids by Parliament, which is essentially what's happening now. By law, order of the government, we are not allowed uh, to uh, take our own lives. And uh, that should not be their decision. That should be our decision, should it not? It should be my death, my choice. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, these people, they've got no idea. None, I don't suppose many of them will be living with pain that shocks them. Yeah, that's right. You're talking about uh, often able-bodied politicians uh, making decisions about people for whom life has become almost unbearable. Uh, I'm glad, Vivian, your life is still bearable and uh, I really appreciate you calling Thank you so us. Much, and you look after yourself, yeah? Thank yeah. you very much for ringing. Thank you. Uh, let's get back to our top story now. And uh, thousands of migrants unlawfully living in the UK will be offered up to £3,000 to voluntarily move to Rwanda. Under new legislation proposed by the government, migrants will also receive housing and support when they arrive in the African country, but only if they go there by choice. Well, the new deal was agreed with Rwanda earlier this year and responds to the legal challenges faced by the controversial deportation scheme. The proposal is separate to the original policy and will act as a contingency in case the scheme is again blocked or struck out by UK courts. But joining us now is Times Chief Political Correspondent, Aubrey Allegretti. Uh, Aubrey, you are the one who broke this story today in The Times. Tell us more. Hi, Alex. Yeah, I mean, really what this responds to is growing concern within government that uh, nearly two years after the original deal with Rwanda was signed by then Home Secretary Priti Priti Patel in April 2022, that there have still not yet been any migrants removed to Rwanda. And the forced removal scheme has sort of been held up due to legal challenges. So ministers uh, and Downing Street, I understand, have been pushing this new plan, which they think could be sort of pulled together very quickly and would effectively see people offered a financial incentive in order to voluntarily relocate to Rwanda. Now, it would utilise an existing scheme, which is the the voluntary resettlement scheme and that effectively means that people who are for example failed asylum seekers can be given money to go back to their country of origin the difference with this scheme is that it's the first time that people would be given money to go to a country that isn't their country of origin but a third safe country instead which the government uh, claims rwanda is so this is potentially for people who are from places like iran afghanistan who can't go back to their country of origin. Uh, I'm assuming, Aubrey, this is a proposal at the moment. Uh, should it become uh, an official system, will it have to go through Parliament first? Will there have to be a vote? I'd say we're already sort of pretty far through the process on this. It's currently gone to what's known as ministerial right round, which is effectively where the Home Office tries to get collective sign-off from all the other secretaries of states and departments but it's not something that they think will need legislation. So they actually think that it could be up and running in a matter of weeks. And if you look at the number of people potentially uh, affected, obviously the initial Rwanda scheme, we're only talking about removing 1,000, 2,000 people. So the numbers probably would be quite small. But the pool that the government hopes to be able to sort of apply this scheme to is very large. There were 31,000 people who had their asylum applications denied last year. So there are lots of people the government thinks who this scheme could help get out of the country faster. Uh, and uh, have there been any sort of assessments of how many people are willing to take this up? Because I would imagine I don't think many people will be asking for three grand and a one-way flight to Kigali. I'll take it. <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure. There is the £3,000 that you mentioned, but there is also the sort of extra package of support. So effectively, they've got their accommodation paid for for up to five years. They get extra training, support and skills. 
so that they can transfer and get a new job in the Rwandan economy. So the Home Office kind of hopes that actually they are effectively saying to these failed asylum seekers, what's the point in staying in the UK? You know, you're not allowed to work anyway. So why don't you sort of go and start a new life and we'll give you the money and the tools to be able to do that? Just a last question quickly, or before you go. Um, could it not, won't critics of this scheme, if it's not voted on by Parliament, say that uh, the government's being rather presumptuous with our money? I mean, 3,000 quid a time, uh, you know, it's quite a lot of money. It's taxpayers' money. Surely uh, the government just can't decide on their own back to just start shelling this out left, right and centre? Well, well um, I don't believe that the government had to uh, sort of get Parliament's permission to pay for the initial... Uh, Rwanda removal scheme that obviously still hasn't got up and running. There are lots of ways the government pays for things and makes decisions that don't happen through primary legislation, i.e. passing a bill. So um, this, they don't think, would be any different. There are certainly critics of the plan. There are multiple Conservative MPs. One of them, Andrea Jenkins, raised this and was very critical of it at Prime Minister's questions with the uh, Prime Minister today. But there are others who I'm told have been uh, frantically and very angrily typing messages on WhatsApp so uh, I suspect that there would be some resistance from those Conservative MPs who think that it's uh, even more farcical to effectively be paying people to try and go to Rwanda and makes it look like the government can't actually deliver on its original promise of forcing people to go there. Indeed, that is how it looks. A farce within a farce, topped off with a bit more farce. Great story, uh, Aubrey. Aubrey. Well Thank done. you ever so much. Well, let's speak now to Dr Mike Jones, Executive Director at Migration Watch UK. Now, my feeling is about this, Mike. I mean, the government are just so desperate to see an aeroplane go to Kigali with some migrants on it yeah. that they would do anything to get us to that point, even if you do find, you know, a small cohort of people who have come here illegally take the government up on their offer. It's not going to go anyway to stopping the problem that most of the West is seeing with mass curated, organised inward migration from countries, uh, usually with connections to pretty dodgy regimes. I mean, it's, it's pointless, really, isn't it? Yeah, it's a complete waste of time. I mean, essentially, the, the government haven't gotten to the root cause of the problem, which is the Human Rights Act. That makes it very difficult to deport somebody to their country of origin. And it makes it very difficult to deport somebody to a third safe country like Rwanda. And, uh, you know, this is a slap in the face to the hard pressed taxpayer. You know, we're going to shell out about half a billion pounds on the Rwanda plan. Even if Rishi Sunak doesn't deport anyone, you know, we're, we're obligated to pay around 370 million over the next five years. So this is just an exercise in, in public relations and optics. They want, uh, you know, a photo of bums on seats on a flight to Kigali before the next general election. But it's not going to solve the problem. Yeah, I mean, this is what this is all about. There's a, a certain desperation, uh, you know, among the cabinet ministers, among, you know, Rishi Sunak uh, and, uh, you know, the foreign secretary and so on and so forth. There's a desperation to just show the public, hey, ho, we've got someone on a plane and they've gone to <laughs> East Africa. Uh, uh, and uh, don't the government realise that we're going to go, yeah, but you gave them 3,000 quid. Yeah, you've got, uh, I mean, got one on a plane and 500 more have come over. I mean, I know we're just sort of talking about a complete shambles here, but uh, doesn't Rishi realise that we're all going to work out exactly why those people are on that plane? Because we, the British taxpayers, were forced to give them three grand each. Uh, this could cause more damage than good for the government, could it not? Yeah, I mean, up until the last few years, the Conservatives have been very good at managing the media and dominating the news cycle. And they've tried to do something similar with illegal migration. For example, the BB Stockholm. They thought that would, you know, galvanise public opinion in their favour. <laughs> How but, did that work out? You know, <laughs> well, it hasn't worked out very well, has it? Um, and, you know, as you say, Kevin, something very similar could, could transpire with this. Uh, you know, ultimately, what we need is a deterrent we need to detain and deport people. What we don't need is a bribe where the uptake will be very small. It seems to me that whatever this government tries to do on this topic, there's a Gordian knot of international and domestic legislation and an army of immigration lawyers waiting to thwart them at every single move. And what I don't understand is constant reports saying that there are some pretty sinister connections of the people trafficking organisations, Wagner mercenaries, Russia, Taliban, the list goes on and on. This is largely being used as an act of grey zone warfare by hostile regimes against the West. And yet 
yet we turn around and say, well, we can't turn the boats around because that would be breaking international law. Is it breaking international law when you can point at something and say, this is threatening national security? That's an interesting question. I mean, obviously you can't let people drown in the channel because that is breaking international law. And there's a you know a huge di diplomatic issue here. If we just you know put these people on boats and sent them back to France, the, the French could actually blockade us. And that would lead to a diplomatic crisis. However, um, the European Court of Human Rights is a huge, huge problem. Um, however, the European Convention of Human Rights isn't just something imposed on us by you know foreign judges in a faraway place. It's actually part of domestic legislation. It's part of the Human Rights Act. And it enshrines what they call the principle of non refoulement which makes it very difficult for the Home Office to deport people to their country of origin or to a third safe country like Rwanda. I mean, the Home Office has just declared Turkey an unsafe country. You know, it's, it's an ally of the UK, it's a member of NATO. They send judges to the European Court of Human Rights, yet it's deemed unsafe. You know, this, this is like something out of a Franz Kafka novel. It's absurd. <laughs> Exactly, it exactly right. And I wonder where we'll be whenever the election is. Shall we say it's the end of October? I think the picture will still look pretty bleak uh, for Mr Sunak. Mm -hmm. uh, great to talk to you, Mike. Thank you very much. Dr Mike Jones there, Executive Director of Migration Watch UK, a very fine organisation. Now, coming up after the break, there have been fireworks in the Commons as the Prime Minister is slammed for his handling of the Tory race row. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have was moved another on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, Sir Keir Starmer has criticised the Prime Minister over his handling of the Tory donor racism row. The Conservatives are under pressure to return the £10 million donated by Frank Hester after he made racist comments about the MP Diane Abbott. Well, speaking during Prime Minister's questions, Rishi Sunak insisted the matter was closed. <laughs> the alleged comments were wrong, they were racist, and he has now... As I said, the comments were wrong, they were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse and that remorse should be accepted, Mr Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the man bankroll and the Prime Minister also said that the member for Hackney North should be shot. How low would he have to sink? What racist, woman-hating threat of violence would he have to make before the Prime Minister plucked up the courage to hand back the £10 million that he's taken from him? Well, joining us now is former Conservative adviser Charlie Rowley. Charlie, I mean, yeah, I know you're going to agree with me on this, but this seems to be a pretty zero-sum game because I'm fairly certain if one were to look at various donations to the Labour parties over the years and some of their views on certain topics that may not be politically correct, could, uh, political parties the world over will be having to write checks and send money back to someone who might have once said something. Um, and I don't understand why this is the punishment for the alleged crime. I think that's right. You don't have to look too far. It's sad to say um, in all parties where people have said things that they shouldn't. Um, I think if you're an MP, a member of parliament, if you're democratically elected, if you're in the public eye, uh, then of course there should be an additional uh, element of scrutiny because you are a public servant, I suppose, compared to someone that might be uh, in the private sector or, or, or not. But uh, the comments that were made um, were uh, totally wrong. They were racist. There has been an apology. Um, I just don't understand the concept myself personally as to why anybody would want to hand £10 million back to this individual. I think that money could just be uh, uh, better spent. But you're absolutely right, Alex, that you know, there are too many people that have obviously made uh, comments in the past. And I think it is just a, a light that needs to be shone on politics in general and every political party to remind people that language matters. Uh, it does. Uh, and uh, a fiery exchange between the Prime Minister and Keir Starmer today at uh, Prime Minister's Question Time. Uh, and, to, and I thought uh, Rishi did quite well, uh, saying, well, you know, you can talk. Uh, he did kind of put Starmer in his place. But the elephant in the room that wasn't mentioned was this. You know, uh, what this guy said was wrong. I mean, it seems to be a bit odd that we're talking about it five years after the event. These comments were made five years ago in 2019. Uh, but the elephant in the room as everybody leapt to the defence of poor Diane Abbott, and she didn't deserve this, by the way, uh, is that uh, she is currently suspended uh, from the Parliamentary Labour Party for racism. Uh, for a, 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 an anti-Semitic letter that she wrote to the Observer. Uh, that didn't seem to crop up in Keir's argument. Uh, he's got questions to answer about that, hasn't he? Well, I think that's right. Look, you know, um, uh, whatever the problems that we have in this country, um, uh, I can guarantee that Diane Abbott is not the solution. Um, and uh, she has fallen foul uh, because of language, inappropriate language that she has used herself, anti-Semitic language that she has used herself, which is why she no longer sits in the Labour Parliamentary Party. Um, so she's no shrinking violet when it comes to making comments uh, herself. Um, but that is no, uh, uh, I think, excuse for, um, obviously it's no excuse for the comments that were made by um, Mr Hester, um, but it just continues to show that, you know, politicians uh, have to be even more uh, accountable to what they say uh, and it doesn't just stop with the Conservative Party. Diane Abbott is one example. Angela Rayner has called for the lynching uh, 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 of, of MPs. Um, you know, Tory scum is often used by those on the left and I think um, at a time when, you know, there is a fear for MP safety, when people uh, you know, we've seen the death of two MPs because of extremism on both sides 
uh, you know, it is um, a, a terrifying prospect uh, calling for someone to be shot. Um, but it just highlights, as I say before, that you know, language really does matter and everybody um, just needs to be um, uh, responsible. But hold on, I mean, I, I had questioned whether language does matter. I think most people sitting out here watching it are at the stage now that they're fed up with these constant rows like, oh, someone shouldn't have said this, someone shouldn't have said that, someone said something that we all know is truly appalling. Did anyone, you know, actually suffer, come to physical harm from it? No, they didn't. Let's move on and actually deal with the issues at hand because there's plenty of those facing the country today. This, to me, just seems like a stupid confected row that people have in Prime Minister's question times when Mildred's sitting at home in Milton Keynes is wondering how she's going to pay a gas bill. Well, you don't want anybody um, sitting at home thinking or agreeing with uh, Frank Hester that, um, uh, you know, uh, all black women should be shot. That's where the language has to be. You have to have responsible language. Um, but you're, uh, you're right to an extent that, you know, it is about tackling the big issues. And it does mean that, you know, uh, if you're talking about things that are happening on London and many other city centres every weekend where you're seeing hate crime and hate speech, sorry, uh, uh, articulated on the streets uh, of our city centres, you know, broadcasting things like river to the sea, from the river to the sea on our national parliamentary building, uh, that is language that needs to be uh, clamped down on, stamped out. At least need to take action. You're right. It is about action that needs to be taken in some of these areas. Uh, what people say, of course, people are entitled to an opinion. Um, but when it strays beyond opinion and uh, trying to address certain issues, for example, Lee Anderson was trying to address the issue of extremism in this country, where he was questioning who actually runs Britain because the police don't tackle uh, the, you know, the areas in terms of the examples I'm just uh, you know, talking about. Uh, you know, you can have a conversation about that as a camp, as a country, um, but what you obviously can't do is stray into uh, inciting hate. Um, uh, in, in inflicting fear onto people's lives, uh, or certainly uh, you can't say anything and shouldn't be saying anything that is anti-Semitic or racist. Yeah, this is a, this is a Westminster bubble story. That isn't to yeah, say is. that that isn't to say that everyone doesn't condemn racism mm. and what that guy said uh, was awful. Uh, but all over the country, people will be asking two questions: one, who the hell is Frank Hester, I... and two, uh, haven't these politicians got something they... more relevant to my life? They have to been, talk about. If they hadn't dug around in previous yeah. and past conversations about five years ago, no one would have even known yeah. he said this People thing. around the country will not be caring yeah. a guy they never heard of made some nasty comments five years ago. It's ridiculous. Uh, but you're never ridiculous, Charlie. You are. Thank you so much for Thanks, joining Charlie. us. Uh, now, next, uh, children who want to change their gender will no longer be prescribed puberty blockers uh, on the NHS in England. In a landmark ruling, clinicians said there was not enough evidence to show the drugs were safe and should only be used in clinical trials. Uh, it comes as the UK's only dedicated gender identity clinic for children, the Tavistock Clinic, will close at the end of this month. Well, joining us is NHS GP and broadcaster Dr Renee Hunderkamp and uh, Stephanie Davis, RI, founder of the campaign group Transgender Trend, which calls for evidence-based care for children with gender dysphoria. Uh, Dr Renee, I'm going to start with you. Um, my understanding was there actually, even though GIDS uh, is closing, my understanding was there were going to be multiple other clinics providing similar similar services popping up around the United Kingdom as a number of young people now who think they have gender dysphoria has absolutely exploded. I think this is a very good move. I don't understand why we were allowing this sort of mass abuse of children to permanently harm their young bodies, make adult decisions at such a young age. But it, it does call into question, what will all these various clinics now be doing for these kids? Well, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, Alex, I think that we all have to accept that these children, when they present, have got something going on, usually mental health issues, autism, ADHD, um, depression. And so what these clinics should be doing is offering a therapeutic exploration of why these children are feeling like they are. And that in itself will help them think about what's going on and hopefully come to terms with the fact that they actually are not born in the wrong body, which is what lots of them are presenting with, but actually have other issues which need to be sorted out. And that's why it's important that we do have somewhere for them to go because these are highly distressed children without a shadow of a doubt. But as clinicians, we need to actually put their safeguarding first and work out why they're distressed and help them with that distress. Uh, let's 
Bring you in, uh, Stephanie. Uh, the, the way I, what surprises me about this is the NHS has now said we're not going to be prescribing these pu puberty blockers uh, anymore because we're not convinced they're safe. It really does beg the question, well, why the hell have you mm -hmm. been prescribing them all these years up until now? I would suggest this is going to open the door for a lot of legal actions for kids who, uh, who will say their lives were ruined by these life-changing drugs. What on earth has been going on? Why have the NHS been prescribing life-changing drugs that completely change these kids' lives for the rest of their lives, and now they're suddenly saying they're not convinced they're safe? This is a scandal, isn't it? It is. I think it's a, it's a huge medical scandal because this information, or rather lack of information about puberty blockers, has been known from the start. If you, see, if you look at what the Tavistock was saying in 2015, they were saying, you know, nothing, no medicine is completely re reversible. It doesn't solve all the problems. Um, and Hannah Barnes, who wrote the book Time to Think, which was the investigation into the Tavistock, um, estimates there are around 2,000 children altogether who were given puberty blockers on the basis of, you know, inadequate evidence, very low quality evidence on the benefits of blockers, but also some of the risks we've, we've known. We've known the risks uh, to bone density, to fertility, and also the, the risk to brain development, which could be irreversible. You know, there could be irreversible effects, but there are also lots of risks that we don't yet know because the studies haven't been done. So we've been experimenting on children's bodies and minds, essentially, for, you know, certainly since 2011 was when the, when the toughest stock started their puberty blockers trial. And in 2014, they rolled it out to everyone without having even published any results. So, yeah, this is a huge medical scandal, and thank goodness it, it, it seems to be over. Although, I mean, it, it, it's very reassuring that puberty blockers will no longer be available. But there's still the chance of a clinical trial, which, it, to my mind, is unethical. I think a child not going through puberty is an adverse outcome in itself. Mm. But also, cross-sex hormones will still be offered at age 16. Now, the NHS said that they that would be a separate service specification. We wrote to them to ask whether that would be uh, another public consultation, and we were not given an answer on that. Quick, quick so, question to you, uh, uh, Stephanie, before we move back to Renee. Uh, this is, as you say, it just strikes me as an enormous scandal. We've been doing this for a generation to thousands of kids, giving them drugs that are now ruled by the NHS not to be safe. We need, a, I, I hate public inquiries, we have far too many of them, but I do feel we need one into what the hell ta the ta Tavistock Clinic was all about. Do, would you agree? Absolutely. So we, we, we hold public inquiries into medical scandals. We're not afraid of doing that. And yet in this area, there have not been, you know, it's taken such a lot of work just to raise awareness of this issue of what's going on. Um, and, you, you know, there, has been, there hasn't been the courage to actually say much earlier than this, we need a public inquiry into what is going on here. And I think that's because of the bullying activism that we've seen, that even the clinicians, uh, medical professionals, teachers, or professionals that work with children have not dared speak out because of the, of the bullying and the legitimate concerns that they could even lose their jobs and livelihoods if they say anything. That has to stop. Uh, Renee, finally, back to you. Uh, I mean, you spoke about uh, young people with autism and <clears throat> depression going to these clinics. I think a big question that needs to be asked and spoken about is what is going on? Why is it that there were only a couple of hundred kids with gender dysphoria presenting at clinics like the Tavistock about a decade ago? And now that is in the thousands. And a condition that previously used to be dominated by men is now being dominated by young girls. What is going on, Renee? 
Well, I think what's going on is we have a degree of social contagion because we see whole classes in some schools where 80% of the girls say they're trans. We actually have social media access, which once a child puts in that they think they might be uncomfortable in their body or they might be trans, they get taken down an algorithm that absolutely feeds that fear until eventually they are convinced that they are in the wrong body. Then they're given all of the information they need about what to say when they get home, what to say at school, what they their rights are. Parents are terrified because what they've done is they've been too scared to actually ask the questions that they need to ask and take the action they need, which is actually leave them alone, let these kids go through puberty and don't actually feed it. We know that most kids, if left to go through puberty, will settle with their own biology. Many of them will be gay. But with these parents are told that if they don't transition their child, they'll have a dead child. Wouldn't they rather have a trans child than a dead child? It all comes back to the bullying of the activists who take these children under their wing and actually ferry them towards puberty blockers mm. and cross -sex, sex hormones. We need to think about social media, the algorithms and what we are feeding our children. We need to look at our teachers and stop our teachers from being too scared or even captured by Stonewall and Mermaid's ideas. Ideology. I had a young policewoman say to me, oh, but isn't it lovely that children born in the wrong body can now speak about it? No child is born in the wrong body. Fact. Right. Yeah, and let's, right. re let's remember, thank you to both of you, that uh, at the Tavistock Clinic, uh, at one point, they were seeing kids as young as eight. Sick. You know, uh, maybe even younger, uh, uh, you know, because it was a girl who was climbing trees. We've, th where, where did common sense go? Mm. This is just crazy. And, and, you know, when did we start treating mental health conditions physically yeah. again? You know, it reminds me of the Victorian era where people were getting lobotomies. It's and, absolutely perverted. Uh, Rene Martin and Stephanie, Stephanie, thank you so much for your time. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Now, coming up after the break, TV icon Paul O'Grady leaves a lasting legacy by giving a generous proportion of his £15.5 million fortune to charities close to his heart. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eave it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer.
the UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And we are joined now by da -da -da -da, our very own Mike Graham to give us a little taste ahead of his show, The Independent Republic of Mike Graham, tonight on Talk TV from 8 until 10 p.m. And uh, I gather you want to talk about funerals, uh, Mike. What's going on with all that? Well, there's a very weird story going on up in Hull where um, the funeral... Uh, uh, an organisation, a funeral business called the Legacy Funeral Business, um, has been sort of uh, invaded by the police. Apparently, they've been sending ashes out to people who thought that their loved ones had been create, uh, cremated, but they haven't been cremated. And they found 35 bodies inside this funeral home, uh, and they're investigating the funeral home for some kind of malfeasance. Nobody's quite sure exactly why they wouldn't, you know, dispose of the bodies they said they disposed of. Could be something to do with money. But it's a very weird thing. A lot of people nowadays aren't even having funerals. So we're going to be talking about that, why you don't do it anymore. It's too expensive. Um, it's too ridiculous a process to go through, and loads of people are not doing it. We're also going to talk about Patrick Balance. Um, you might remember oh, him yeah, as Patrick. the man stood next to Chris. Chris Whitty, next slide, please. Yeah, of uh, he's admitted in his diary that all of the reasons that they gave for, for kids to wear masks in schools and for kids to be vaccinated to go to school were completely and utterly political, completely and utterly bogus and without any foundation whatsoever. Yeah, that is a massive story, actually. His evidence seems yeah. to suggest that he didn't think the government should be preventing kids from going to school, didn't think kids should no. be wearing masks. And what on earth did politicians think they were doing by imposing that level of suffering, which is having long-term effects on the development of kids? Yeah, and it's also having long-term effects on attendance because kids are now going, well, since they told us to stay away from schools, it was dangerous. Uh, now we can just stay away from schools we feel like it. And it's absolutely turned everything on its head. The, the ridiculous COVID inquiry, which has now been officially called totally and utterly biased against yeah. anyone um, who was against lockdown, is a complete waste of money, complete waste of time. And now we know even the scientists didn't believe the science. Yeah, the COVID inquiry uh, is the inquiry that doesn't have a spirit of inquiry. Mm. And uh, these lefties, no matter how many doctors, how many experts, people like Valance turn around and say masks were no good, no point, yeah. don't wear right. them, they're a waste of time. These lefties keep going, no, oh, yeah, no, no, that's rubbish. Got to wear masks. It's a symbol of how, what a virtue-signalling wonderful person yeah. you are. And you're a wonderful I mean, if person, we Mike. If we didn't know that the, the country was going to hell in a handcart then, yeah. you know, well, now we know why. You sure yeah. do now. Uh, Mike, sounds like a great show. Don't forget, uh, tune in to Mike Graham tonight, The Independent Republic, from 8 until 10pm on Talk TV. You, you do, do not want to miss a second. second. Have a good one, mate. <laughs> Do you know, it's funny, yeah, I think this COVID inquiry needs to jog on because uh, the more time goes past, off. the more you become complacent, don't you? And when you think about what we were put through for a year, mm. we're so extreme. Let's do a story on it this week. So yeah. extreme. Right, moving on uh, and happier things, I guess. Uh, Paul O'Grady's legacy extends beyond the screen as it's revealed he left a considerable portion of his £15.5 million fortune to charities close to his heart. The beloved TV presenter gave £775,000 to charities, including Battersea Dogs Home, an organisation connected to his popular ITV show, For the Love of Dogs. O'Grady also set aside £125,000 to the care of his dogs, Nancy, Arthur, that's Arthur with an F, Conchita, Eddie and Sausage. Uh, joining us now is actor and animal rights campaigner and my friend Peter Egan. Hello, Peter. Uh, thank you for joining hey. us. Uh, now, uh, it's not a surprise to me that Paul uh, left a, a great deal of money to various animal charities, especially Battersea Dogs Home. Of course, he made that famous series for the love of dogs which by the way for some reason ITV have given a new to a new host 
who doesn't like dogs and has never owned a dog. dog oh, really? Which, yeah, Alison Hammond seems very strange to me, but we'll park that. Uh, uh, but what I'd like to talk to you about is this 125 grand that he's left yeah. for his five dogs. Now, uh, Alex is not a dog owner or a dog lover. She's a cat woman and she can't see it. You know, <laughs> I, said, I said every dog owner in the country will understand that. You've been a multi... Uh, dog owner. I've seen you marching around with about seven dogs in the past. Yeah. Uh, so we understand it, don't we? we he, he's worried about his dogs. Absolutely. I mean, without question. I mean, I have four dogs at the moment. Uh, you'll hear them in the background in a second because it's coming up for their dinner time. And I think it's the most wonderful thing that he's done is to leave that. I mean, if, if you think 125,000 for five dogs, is it, he's, he's left it to. I mean, it costs you about 15,000 pounds to keep a dog during its lifetime anyway, I think, perhaps even more. So it's not excessive. Mm -hmm. And he's been very generous in, in every other area. Um, I also, I, we, we used to have cats as well, so I adore cats too. So I don't have, you know, really a, a huge division uh, between uh, cats and dogs, uh, although I don't have cats at the moment. So, I, I mean, I fully understand. I think he was a remarkable and wonderful man, Paul. And, and I fully understand why he would want to have his dogs looked after in the way that he'd like them looked after for the rest of their lives after his death. Let me, uh, sorry to interrupt that, but I've got to ask Peter a question because I kind of know the answer. Uh, you now devote, I would suggest, most of your life to animal welfare campaigning, and uh, here's to you for that. You still maintain you. your extremely successful acting career as well, Downton Abbey, etc. Uh, but uh, you once told me that the turning point in your life, you got a dog and you found yourself looking into his eyes and you felt that connection. And at that point, you realise humanity and animals share this planet and we've got to give them a good break. Absolutely, yeah. That was DJ, um, a little Border Collie Spaniel Cross I rescued in 1999. And um, he, DJ really changed my life. He was my gatekeeper. I mean, he was the most flattering dog for an actor to have because every time I came in, at the end of the day, he'd be waiting for me and I'd talk to him and he'd look at me and, he, and, me, and turn his head to the side as if he thought what I was saying was fascinating. <laughs> and he, he, he was so flattering and so wonderful. I adored him. And he just opened the gate to me to all sentience. He made me realise that, um, that all animals have the same kind of sentience we have. They just speak with a different language. But they're remarkable. Um, animals are such a great addition to our lives. And wildlife and wild animals are such an amazing uh, keystone uh, species, uh, all of them, to our planet. They help our planet in, in remarkable ways. Yeah, and of course, he gave uh, money to various charities, didn't he? And I'd imagine animal charities are suffering a lot at the moment at a cost of living crisis. So uh, hopefully he will give some protections to some pooches and pussy cats out there who uh, sadly might have uh, been given up by their owners for a plethora of reasons. Yeah, I, I know so many people, I know so many people, including me, who, when they had a dog foisted on them, they go, oh, I don't want a dog. And within yeah. a week, they love that dog to bits. Uh, it's a special yeah. relationship yeah. and great to yeah. talk to you about it, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thank you oh, so much. Thank you very quickly. Also, vet bills are astronomical. Yeah, no, oh, there's that. That much true. I know. That much I know. Thank you to Peter Egan. Sadly, we've come to the end of the show, Alex. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time tomorrow, 9.30. It's like someone's fast-forwarding you. Up next is Ian Collins. Have a good afternoon and we'll see you tomorrow. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. There's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> just 